All right, looks like we are live. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. I want to thank you all for being here for this important show. I've got Professor David McQueen and George Bond, Batman and Robin from Team Standing for Truth or Standing for Truth Ministries to discuss some important topics tonight. George Bond, Professor McQueen, or I should say Batman. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. What's going on today? Oh, Johnny, can I share a bit of Australiana with you before we start? Please. Go ahead, brother. Okay. Just bear with me for a second. It won't, it won't be like, it'll only be um, a second or two, but um, can you see that? Not yet. There it comes. Yes, birds on the ground. That's their cockatoos, and they're eating the little acorns from my... Um, from my nature strip tree in front of my house. So I thought I'd share that uh, a bit of Australiana <laughs> with you. <laughs> well, that is, uh, that is great. Uh, uh, we are so excited, Donnie, to begin this uh, discussion of what our critics call the heat problem. Uh, I'm going to take 15 minutes, and it would be a real help to me, Donnie, if you could hold me to that and let me know when I've got one minute left at 14. Sure because we've set aside um, 45 minutes for Brother George, and that requires some explanation. Notice the terms that I've got in the background here. If you would give me the full screen, we'll explain how critical it is for George to be part of this. Notice in item four here, thermal engineering, and then note up, notice up here behind me, heat, transfer physics, a lot of the answers that we want to give you in the next uh, month about this heat problem are engineering solutions. Um, and George, you are um, perfectly suited with your engineering background to give these engineering answers, aren't you? Well, I hope so. Uh, I don't have all the answers, but uh, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure I'll... Uh have something to say about it. Yeah. Oh, yes. And so let's go ahead and uh, I'll do my introduction. Uh, and uh, I want to start out. Professor uh, McQueen, if I could, brother. I'm sorry. I go do, ahead. Oh, no, that's that's okay. That's okay. I appreciate the intro, uh, George and David. I do want to let the audience know that as always, we want to be interactive. So we will be taking some audience questions. Uh, we probably won't be answering those questions until about the hour and 15 minute mark, but that gives yeah. you guys the opportunity to tag me at Standing for Truth. If there's, uh, if, if there's those critics out there in the chat that have some objections to the global flood or any objections to what we're saying, tag me. We're here to uh, answer your questions. As I like to say, you got questions, we got answers. So I appreciate it. And uh, Professor David McQueen, the floor is yours, brother. I'm looking forward to this. Okay. Uh, I want to thank people that send their comments to uh, Standing for Truth. I have become more active in looking at the uh, Standing for Truth website. And I compliment a great many people that go on there to ask questions of me and Donnie and George. And so that is a pleasant way to lead into my first criticism of uh, our critics. Uh, they will uh, make a comment to Donnie that requires them to understand the two volume work of Dr. Snelling. And they'll make a comment about Snelling and Baumgartner and others talking about 10 to the 26 joules, or they'll comment about uh, how we got this insurmountable heat problem. Well, I'm going to be critical right now and say, you guys need to do your homework. You need to go online. You need to buy these books. And you simply can't sort through this without understanding uh, the basics of the physics of it. And so what I want to do in the next 10 minutes is introduce you to the vocabulary that you need to know. And class, I'm expecting you to take notes on all this. The vocabulary that you need to know to understand what George is going to tell you 
in the final 45 minutes and what I'm going to point out in the second hour. We've already talked about doing two of these because look at the amount of information you have to absorb to understand this. So let's start um, the way Aristotle started. Aristotle taught his uh, students that if you want to succeed, you have to write, you have to answer the fundamental questions first. And once you get those fundamental questions answered, the rest flows. Now, you have to be clear on the fact that those of us that will appear tonight are young earth creationists who believe that there was one world continent that broke apart in a catastrophic setting and generated heat. No question that there's some uh, heat generated. But let's understand the terms. So when you go to look up whether Andrew Snelling really did say that you need 10 to the 26 joules, you'll understand what the uh, word means. Look up here in this area and write down joule per calorie. Now, this is not a calorie exactly like the number of calories in a hamburger, but it is a, a unit of heat. And here is the C that I'm using here. As we go along with this, we'll be substituting other word, other variable names like Q and K, because there's a confusion about this being centigrade. But for tonight, let's use this as the basic idea. A calorie, as we will see, is um, a unit of thermal engineering. And a joule is the metric equivalent of what the old 20th century engineers called a British thermal unit. Well, we'll forget that. We'll go over to the modern world and a, four joules per calorie is the basic conversion that we'll use. But see, it can't start there and it can't stop there. Notice this next word. I hope you can see the red one there, a watt. You're familiar with watts because your microwave is calibrated in watts. If you have a generator, it puts out a certain number of watts. And so that's an important term to realize when you're talking about what our critics have called our heat problem. Let's go next to meters squared. This is the equivalent, if you will, of yards squared. But in the metric system, this is about one yard by one yard. In other words, it's an area. And so when we talk about blobs underneath the Hawaiian Islands and other things, we're talking about a, a volume of heat moving up through an area such as a square uh, meter. Now, this unit here or this mathematical construct is something you're going to see repeated as we talk about this over the next month. 0 0.086 kilocalories, H, there's a meter squared, that's the area per degree C. And so this is truly degree C, and you can see it's because it's got the degree sign there. Kilo, like a kilogram, is a 1,000 grams, and so you see where the kilocalories come in, and also the potential confusion about this not being centigrade, but calorie. So let's continue to go here. Let me move my camera down and go from item six back over to item four. And this is where George's expertise come in, comes in. As I have studied this in preparation for the night, many of the issues are issues of what are called thermal engineering. And this is a well-known 21st century area of study where you're, you're dealing with how do you uh, engineer a nuclear power plant or a house in such a way that you control the thermal outside and the thermal inside. This leads us to number five, the next unit that we're going to talk about, the concept of thermal energy. How much energy 
is moving from the outside part of your glass pane to the inside. What's another word you need to understand? You need to word you need to understand the word conduction and the word convection. And even though you might not be used to the mathematics and physics of this, you're aware that if I take one of my grandchildren's wooden blocks and I heat up this block and put it against the other wooden block, there will be a certain amount of conduction of heat from this hot block to the cold block. And so that's a fairly simple way to describe it. How much time do I have left, Donnie, please? Well, you got plenty of time, Professor McQueen, about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, good. We're moving along here. Now, let's go to the next word, and that's the word convection. Now, once again, we will, over the next month, get into the mathematics and the physics and even the differential equations dealing with these things. But for now, all you got to do is go put a pot on to boil tea water. In other words, just boil some water. And if you have, like Mrs. McQueen has, some clear glass pots, you can watch convection. You that are cooks know the word rolling boil. Well, that's convecting the heat from, in our case, a gas burner underneath it up. And it's the analogy between the core and mantle, the mantle and the crust. We're moving in this pattern heat from below to up. And we're going to suggest that there is a area that has not been explored as much as it should about that heat, those blobs, B-L-O-B-S, moving heat down as well as up. Now, once we get past this vocabulary, we get into the whole uh, discipline that's called heat transfer physics. And as a mineralogist, let me give you an example of uh, how uh, complex this is when you think it through. And, whoops, there went some of the block. Oh, there went a blob. So a block and a blob fell there, but we can correct that. So let's make sure that we're understanding it from this vocabulary. Imagine this to be uh, the quartz mineral that we have introduced to you many times, silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide is a uh, geologically important molecule is in the mantle, it's in the crust, it's in the core, probably even, although there's some debate about that. Well, imagine this to be that crystal structure, that hexagonal crystal structure. Well, it turns out that one of the areas that I'm exploring as a mineralogist in regard to the mineral problem is what happens in what's called a mineral phase change. As this quartz goes deeper and deeper in the mantle and interacts with iron and other metals, there are other minerals formed in what we'll talk about in the future that are called phase diagrams. Well, these other minerals sometimes trap heat within their lattice structure. And then as you move this lattice and it moves up in the Earth's crust, you can have uh, what would be called a lattice change. Let me make sure I'm using the correct vocabulary here. Yeah, we're talking about energy carriers and energy sinks that, that are due to lattice vibrations in minerals that are in some cases a millimeter in diameter. We will save a discussion about the movement of electrons in this, and there are actually photons moving in this. But here is where the kicker comes that we all have to do our research on. Many of the answers to these things, as I was working on today, deal with the boundary between classical mechanics. Now I'm talking about the way Isaac Newton would have thought about the friction 
caused by a ball rolling down a impl- incline and causing friction on that. That'd be classical mechanics. And then a whole area that I am delving into now that's called quantum statistical mechanics. Uh, this allows us to address both energy storage and energy transfer. Now, keep in mind that um, as the mantle convicts, we are presenting an argument that certain of these structures that we've introduced in previous talks that are called blobs, B-L-O-B-S. And here's an example of a blob of uh, something that's coming up from the mantle up above Batman's name here into the lower crust. And then up above here at the top are the Hawaiian Islands. And so we can see where heat would be conducted up through the mantle and the lower and the crust to the Hawaiian Islands. But here's the kicker. George and I have been exploring a whole group of calculations, which could mean that the heat be taken down the blob as quickly as it was taken up. And so many of these seemingly, according to our critics, insurmountable physics problems of 10 to the 26 joules and all this 2000 degrees C and all that kind of stuff. Um, that can be dealt with square meter by square meter. But you have to understand that this is not the same as trying to explain the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. But wait, I've listened to Donnie's latest presentations on genetic issues and X chromosomes and Y chromosomes. And I have to listen to it more than once because it's complicated. So it's as least as complicated as the genetic argument. So how, do, so how would I summarize this uh, in a biblical context? Those of us on Standing for Truth are convinced that the Bible is a historical document and that when it talks about creation and it talks about the fall and it talks about the worldwide flood, those are three what my old boss Bob Gentry would call singularities. These are not times where business or business as usual. You've got granites solidifying in less than a day in day one and day three of uh, the creation. And so part of the argument and part of the resolution to this argument is convincing our evolutionary colleagues that their faith in neo-Darwinism is shaky, but it's still faith. And you have to have faith that the scriptures, as they present an outline, will give us an outline to support our faith. Where am I now in our time, Brother Donnie? You're at about 15 minutes, Professor McQueen. Okay, time flies by. Good. I would like to shovel all this hot lava over to Australia <laughs> and let George Bond take over. Fantastic information, uh, uh, Professor McQueen. And I really appreciate that. And I got to say, I got to say before we hand it over to George, uh, you gentlemen are doing some awesome research and I really appreciate the hard work that you gentlemen are putting into this. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to show my appreciation and say uh, thank you so much for this. So, uh, George Bond, over to you, my good man. Uh, no worries, Donnie. Uh, could you please share my screen? Of course. Uh, I've got a fair bit uh, I want to say. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, you're getting that? Uh, let me get it Not up right yet. now. Yes. There it is. Uh, okay. One of the th that's that's really just a cross section of uh, what uh, we believe the Earth uh, consists of: a solid inner core, a liquid outer core, the mantle, and the crust. Now, 
I'll talk about the uh, the solid inner core and liquid outer core a little bit later. It's actually a, a very big problem for secular geology. But before I go into that, uh, we have to appreciate that uh, geophysics, um, we don't really know a lot about the Earth's formation. There are a lot of assumptions that are made and there are unprovable assumptions. So if, if I can equate that, say, with... Uh, the genome, for example, I mean, we probably understand what approximately, probably no more than about 3% of what the genome actually does. And I would hazard to say that uh, geophysics is um, probably around about that same proportion in terms of the, um, the Earth's structure. Now, just some basic stuff, right? In thermodynamics, heat transfer always occurs from hot to cold. That is the, the most basic point of thermodynamics. Now, uh, Professor McQueen covered a couple of the heat transfer issues uh, or the, the, the methods that uh, heat, heat, heat actually is transferred from one material to, to another. Uh, but what I'd, what I'd like to add, though, there was one, one thing that he missed out on was electromagnetic radiation. So what I'll do is I'll go through some of these and then I'll show you some... Um, uh, some information about um, some of these blobs that uh, Professor McQueen was talking about. <clears throat> now, the, th the, three, the three actual um, uh, methods of heat transfer are, as uh, Professor McQueen noted, conduction. Now, conduction is the, transfer, is, is the heat transfer from a hot to a cold, let's say it's water, from cold water until both samples have the same temperature. And while I'm on temperature, I just want to explain to people the difference between heat and temperature. Okay. If I have a pot of water and I put it on the stove and I heat it up to its boiling point of 100 degrees centigrade, it doesn't matter how much longer I actually heat that water, it will not go over 100 degrees centigrade. But I've certainly added a lot more heat to that water past the 100 degree centigrade mark. I hope you understand that. Now, conductive heat flow always involves the transfer of heat from one location to another in the absence of any material flow. Please remember that, the absence of any material flow. There is nothing physical or material moving from the hot water to the cold water, for example. It's only energy which is transferred from the hot water to the cold water. So heat transfer through solids occurs by conduction. Now, convection. Now, convection is the process of heat transfer from one location to the next by the movement of materials like fluids or uh, viscous uh, material like um, magma, etc. Now, the convection method of heat transfer always involves the, the transfer of heat by the movement of matter, right? Notice the two differences. In conduction, there's no movement of heat by matter, but in convection, there is. Now, in the uh, radiation example, radiation is actually the transfer of heat by means of electromagnetic waves. This energy is carried by electromagnetic waves and does not involve the movement or the interaction of matter. I hope, hope we understand those three concepts there. Now, all objects radiate energy in the form of, elec of electromagnetic waves. Uh, the rate at which this energy is released is proportional to the uh, Kelvin temperature, if we can call that T, raised to the fourth power. If you have a look at the formula, uh, uh, I don't know if people uh, remember, I think uh, I introduced this to them once before on the uh, 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 Earth's uh, energy budget. Uh, apparently, the, radia the radiation rate is, is to the fourth power. So an increase, for example, if you double the temperature, the radiation rate is 16 times. So let me just uh, go to some of the examples that... Um, and, and by the way, I'll just mention that I've, I've had conversations with Dr. Russ Humphreys on this through emails, um, probably about... Uh, probably five or six emails where we went through, and, and I'll, I'll say from the from the outset, I'm no expert in thermodynamics, 
So, but I did, I did consult Dr. Humphreys and we went through some of the examples with the blobs and uh, we, we got some, we got some numbers and I'd like to, I'd like to sh share some of those with you, but keep in mind what I said earlier about geophysics and there's very, very little, or, or we, we know a small percentage of, of how the earth actually um, operates, if you, if you want to call it that. So what, what we did was we went through the, the conduction the convec and convection examples with regards to the, to the blobs. So for those that haven't seen it before, this is an image, a seismic image of the, the blobs. You'll, you'll note one is, uh, I believe that one's under Africa and that one's under the South Pacific. A recent study, this is, this is what uh, schematic, what, what it actually looks like, you'll see these cusps that raise up to the surface. Uh, now, a recent study by the Arizona State University, actually March the 12th, uh, 2022, so you can't get any uh, more recent than that, th they've done seismic imaging, and that's really what the um, uh, blob under Africa looks. If you, if you notice this very light gray outline, that's that's the actual outline of Africa, and those that blob is effectively just below Africa. And just to give you an idea of the size of these things, th they've estimated that if these blobs were on the surface of the Earth, they would constitute uh, around ninety six kilometers thick. Thick. That's a pretty big, uh, pretty big body of material. The other thing I found that uh, through the, through their studies, although they don't tell us what uh, temperature these blobs are at, they do say that they they are hotter, and they're around 1.5 to 3.5 percent denser. Okay, keep that in mind. Dense means it's it's heavy. So you ask yourself why, if the Earth is billions of years old, why are these blobs still within that mantle? They should have sunken uh, deep into um, probably closer to the core rather than where they are at the moment, because if they're heavier or denser, they would have uh, sunken lower to, to, towards the core. Now, now um, in pre, in a previous um, stream that we did, uh, I did some, some actual uh, conductivity uh, calculations and convection calculations, which showed that uh, because, because we really don't know what the temperature of the mantle was, say, before the flood, I did some calculations based on how, how much extra can, can the mantle actually, in, ter in terms of temperature, how much temperature can it increase to absorb this particular heat that they, they claim is a problem for us? My calculation showed an increase of 350 to 400 degrees centigrade of the mantle material was is sufficient to actually absorb that amount of uh, energy or the joules or watts, as um, as Professor McQueen uh, mentioned. Uh, now, let me just uh, find my um, yeah. I I I I base that on. Um, that's the. These are these are formulas you can find uh, easily, by the way, in, um, and I've got some um, uh, uh, links there. So I've, I've used the, th the thermal conductivity um, of various materials, yeah, specifically basalt. Uh, you can see there at 20 degrees centigrade, centigrade it's four, and uh, at 200 degrees centigrade, um, it's also four. So that's an amazing uh, statistic there. Uh, so uh, bearing in mind what uh, Professor McQueen said about one, one cal, it's approximately f f four um, watts. It's actually 4.1868, but we're not going to quibble over uh, something like that. So I, I calculated based on, on those and the, and the thickness of the mantle. I worked out a volume and uh, determined the actual um, thermal conductivity of, um, of the material. And... Um, You'll see, you'll see there, based on our calculations, that uh, it would take approximately 890 million years for that thermal conductivity 
to spread through throughout the mantles. Obviously, there's an issue there. Uh, we're being honest here, right? Right. Uh, we also we also did it under various different uh, scenarios with uh, crust and the oceans. But as I said, we we're still exploring how this this um, uh, heat transfer occurred, and there are many e explanations to it. Although we we don't know much about it. There, there's also, as I said, the electromagnetic radiation, which involves the uh, um, the magnetic field of the Earth. So we're not really sure, right? So anyway, we, we've we've done, or at least I've done the calculations with uh, Dr. Russell Humphrey's uh, help, and uh, it is possible that that the the mantle can absorb that. Um, that heat transfer from from the accelerated um, radioactive radioactive elements. Now, uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the mathematics, um, but there, there's there's uh, what we believe the re, the actual uh, magnetic field was like in the past, where we had these um, reversals of, of of magnetic fields during the flood. So now I'll, I'll say it again, right? Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, we probably need to uh, find more solutions in terms of the geophysics of the Earth and how things operate. And I'll just uh, mention um, uh, that's that's an example of um, uh, what was that called? I think it was called the uh, levitation, uh, something like that. I forget now. But uh, so some of the, some of the things that that we find that supports a young earth is these runaway subduction plates. Now you, you'll, you'll notice, I think they found two actually, they found one uh, under the Pacific and another one uh, somewhere near China. You, you'll notice from that vertical scale, that's 700 kilometers deep. But one of the thing, things I want you to notice is this heat uh, gradation, right? Where where the blue is obviously colder and the red is hotter. Notice at 700 kilometers depth, that subduction plate is still cold. You'd think. Uh, let let me just go through some uh, basic calculations. I think we we when we did the stream on the Hawaiian Islands, we used some empirical. Um, data on the movement of, of the tectonic plates uh, at the Pacific uh, near, near the um, Hawaiian Islands. And I believe it was something around, something around about 70 or 75 millimetres per year. If you equate that to the 700 kilometres, that works out to about approximately 10 million years. So you'd think in 10 million years, part of, the, part of that coal subduction plate would have changed temperature. You know, you'd expect it to be a little bit sort of on the yellow side here, uh, maybe red to yellow and then to, to to blue. But it doesn't. It shows consistently that it's a blue color, which means that subduction plate occurred very quickly. And that's why we call it the runaway subduction plate hypothesis, which, which I think it's... Um, Dr. Baumgartner has has um, quite a few uh, written papers on, on this particular scenario here. Yeah, very so good point. See, yeah, uh, so very you can see you, you can see that you can see there um, what 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 they actually did since this original um, uh, paper. The, the further studies since the original findings shows that the temperature difference is more like three thousand degrees Fahrenheit difference. Now, as I said, you'd expect the temperature of the sub subduction plate to have reached equilibrium with its surroundings after, say, 100 million years. I mean, I haven't done the, the calculations there, but uh, remember I told you, based on a, a rate of 75 mil per year, that subduction plate would have been occurring for 10 million years. Okay, but we're saying at least one-tenth of that, you would have expected some gradation of temperature within, within that uh, plate. So uh, th th there's there's a few other things that I, I, I won't bother you with it because what we intend to do, we, in, we intend to make this a two-part series where part two will be, we, what, 
Professor McQueen and I will be doing, we will be addressing the secular heat problems. Believe it or not, they have more problems than yeah. us with the heat yeah. problem, okay? Yes, so very don't, true. Don't, yeah, don't, don't be uh, wearied by the point when they bring up the heat problem. They have massive heat problems of their own, which they just hand wave away. They never want to discuss them. One, one of them I'm just going to mention towards uh, – now, just acknowledgements here that uh, uh, Professor David McQueen has been great help, uh, Michael Ward, as I mentioned, Scott Devlin of CMI, very approachable. As I said, I've had discussions with Dr. Russ Humphreys through emails, and, and we have to put in there Jordan Kareem as well from Reasons to Doubt because we're really addressing some of his, uh, you know, issues when we talk about uh, this stuff. So – so one of the things I want to talk about is the actual uh, inner core. Uh, we the, the Secular science tell, tells us that the inner core is solid, but the outer core is liquid. So keep, keep that in mind, okay? Now, um, uh, what was it? Okay, so th this is a study. Th these are the – oops. These are the – hold on. These are the references – that uh, this is Scott Devlin's article. These are the references he, he cites, which are secular references. I want you to note this this thing here. All right. Uh, you, you probably never heard of uh, this term called the nucleation energy barrier. What what that means is that uh, I'll just read I'll read what what the excerpt says there. Although nucleation theory has been discussed and tested for the last hundred years. It had not been previously been applied to the formation of the Earth's inner core. By including the nuclear uh, nucleation energy barrier, the uh, Case, Universe, Case Western University team calculated the Earth's liquid metallic core would need a thousand degrees centigrade of cooling below the standard freezing point before it could crystallize, which would take far too long for evolutionary core formation models to work. Now, keep in mind, this is this is their model, right? The time needed for the formation of the inner core blows out beyond the expected one billion year age. So they they're saying that the the inner core and the outer core took a billion years to form. The, the, their own their own calculations say this would blow out to at least ten billion years. Even that's even longer than the alleged four point five billion year uh, years of the uh, age of the entire Earth. So hence the conundrum for, for, for long-age Earth formation theories, the inner core's existence is baffling. It's a paradox. This is one of the things that I, I mentioned about the, the uh, secular heat problems a and, and geophysics in general. We don't understand about the makeup of the Earth's composition and how it actually operates. And, and, and until we know all that, we, we really can't address... Um, the heat, the heat issues, in any great extent. Now, having said all that, there is another model apart from the Baum Gardner model, which talks about fusion. Uh, that that is that. I'll just cite a few ex examples. I'll just stop sharing here. Uh, no need to. I'll just cite some examples where we know for a fact that. I think it's around 90% of the Earth's radioactive material is found on the dry continents, okay? Using a fusion model where we know that during the um, um, catastrophic flood events, the Earth's crust would have been pushed and pulled uh, considerably. Now, knowing that the continental crusts are pre predominantly quartz, it's no different to a piezo switch on your uh, uh, a barbecue, for example, to light your barbecue. This compression and tension of the crust would, would, would uh, create um, similar electrical type um, um, generation where where when they when that electricity uh, reacts with um, certain metals like iron, uh, gold, uh, platinum, etc., it creates heavy uh, heavier elements like uranium, thorium, etc. This has been proven, by the way. This has been shown through 
during lightning storms. It's been shown through the Z, Z pinch experiments. And those people that know about the Z pinch experiments, they, they've been repeated thousands, over a thousand times, I believe. And the interesting part about this is they actually concentrate a very high temperature laser beam onto the metal. And here's, here's the, the most important part of this. It creates all of the uh, heavy heavier elements of the periodic table past iron. Please understand this. With a parent-daughter ratio similar to what we find in in uh, heavier elements today okay so that's a and, and by the way this fusion this fusion reaction absorbs the heat it doesn't actually generate heat so under this model there is no heat problem so so we can appeal to two models effectively um uh, being honest we have we have to consider both um uh, some people um you know, except the catastrophic plate tectonics model, others, uh, the hydro, hydroplate uh, tectonics model uh, based on Walt Brown's um, theory. So really, that's all I wanted to cover, uh, Professor McQueen, because I'd like to leave the discussion on the secular heat problems to our part two discussion. Yes. Uh, as I said, I'm expecting a phone call probably within the next uh, 15 minutes Okay. So I, uh, I might have to leave abruptly, but um, it's, it's not a yeah, problem. Hopefully, I've added, I've added to the discussion. Very, very good. I uh, want you to have the freedom to deal with the uh, issues there in Australia. So you drop out whenever you wish. Uh, go ahead, Donnie, and give me the full screen, and let's review some of the things that uh, George, in his engineering uh, presentation, has given us and the uh, critical importance of this. Now, let me tell a story that I told before, and many of you that have followed my presentations have heard this, but it's worth retelling. In the mid-1980s, when I was full-time with the Institute for Creation Research, and Dr. Henry Morris, Dr. Dwayne Gish were my mentors during that time, one of the most common encouragements they would give to those of us in our 30s, when they were in their 60s, they would say to us, when you go out, remember that we're the Institute for Creation Research, not the Institute for Creation Answers. Yep. Let's make the analogy to standing for truth. Donnie and his colleagues that set this um, area of discussion up years ago made it clear that they were to discuss all different kinds of issues, theological issues, the left side of an argument, the right side of an argument, and so forth. And so as George and I and others that are part of our uh, research group here at Standing for Truth, as we delve in to the kind of physics that you see behind me here, we are looking for the truth of things. Do we tonight have one unifying equation we can put out here that will solve every aspect of the heat generated by either catastrophic plate tectonics or by rapid radioactive decay at different times uh, in uh, a 6,000 year earth history? The answer is obviously no. But let's look at what we can say in the uh, uh, whole area that uh, uh, George has gone over with us here. In the 70s, when I was going through my academic training as a geologist, both at the University of Tennessee and the University of Michigan, it was considered gospel that you had a solid core, a solid inner core, a liquid outer core, and presumably there was geophysics evidence from very large earthquakes that will go, uh, that will send waves called P waves and shear waves throughout the entire volume of the earth. It was uh, almost a gospel idea that 
uh, the solid and the liquid core could easily be understood within a 4.5 billion year time frame. Notice with interest, this 10 billion year calculation revolving around the solid core and the, the whole idea that if you have a, a solid core and you've got this, uh, uh, this uh, nucleation energy barrier and this magic number of 1,000 degrees uh, C, if you really use that number to do this calculation, if the core is really solid, it is 10 billion years old, twice the evolutionary viewpoint. Now, the answer I've gotten or the challenge I've gotten over the years that I've spoken about a 6,000-year-old Earth is a uh, challenge that runs this way. They say, okay, McQueen, you claim that this number is older than we say the uh, uh, age of the Earth is. What can you show us that shows us that the age of the Earth is younger than what we're uh, saying? Donnie and the team that does the computer science side of Standing for Truth have done a wonderful job in compiling a number of dozens, actually, of uh, uh, presentations that George and I have done together and separately that deal with some of the arguments for um, a young Earth. Those of you that were kind enough to watch my debate with uh, Snake the other week uh, are aware that there's a very good argument that the decay of the Earth's magnetic field gives us a clear indication of an Earth that can be only really 10,000 years old using actual data and the mathematics of extrapolation. It's not a, a complicated thing. And so uh, there are uh, counter arguments. Now, let's go back to something that George introduced to me really the first time six months ago that I had not caught these this series of arg of arguments or these series of observations about uh, blobs being found in areas of the Pacific and areas of Africa. Let's go to one of my favorite continents, the continent of Africa, and in the African winter, my summer of 2018 and 2019, I did geologic field work in Africa, combined 50-50 with uh, preaching along the way with my team. Well, as I look at the igneous and metamorphic petrology of Africa below the um, equator, this whole issue of a blob illustrated by my very long paper object here, if the bottom of this blob really is at the mantle outer core boundary, and then the top of it up in this area where I've got my hand is the Hawaiian Islands, or let's say the country of Zimbabwe, where I did my field work, um, the old Rhodesia, if this is right underneath there, then we've got two very interesting research uh, issues. There are tremendous volumes of granitic rocks in Zimbabwe and all through uh, Southern Africa. If you go down to um, South Africa, you have the Kimberlites, the diamonds that we've spoken about before. Uh, you have got riches of cobalt, copper, lead, zinc, chromium in the areas that are called the Bushveld of uh, South Africa. So it's beginning to crystallize in my mind that these uh, enormous blobs that are under Africa all over the, uh, the continent can cut two ways. It's a way for uh, this explosive volcanic 
um, movement of a kimberlite can bring diamonds to the surface from really, some would say, the outer core boundary or at least the lower mantle, all the way blasting up into the crust where the top of this whiteboard would be uh, Zimbabwe. But the second thing that we're exploring is just what um, uh, uh, George uh, commented about. If the blob has within it a fusion reaction going on, that fusion reaction would actually absorb heat. And to use the geophysical and the engineering word, it would be a heat sink, S-I-N-K, which would take this heat away from the crust and down back into the mantle and the core. And so tremendous potential is being opened up by creation scientists studying these issues in the 21st century. I certainly was never introduced to this, even at the University of Michigan, where I was uh, taught uh, geophysics. I have over the years at Virginia State University in the early 80s and then at the Institute for Creation Research, I actually taught geophysics. And none of these equations uh, that give numbers like this 96 kilometer num number that he talked about, you know, we talked about convection and conduction. But the idea of electromagnetic radiation and how that might tie in to the physics of the Earth, these are uh, very new and very uh, recent uh, advances. It, now, how would I summarize this in the five minutes before our one-hour break? This is the way I would summarize it. Our critics continue to accuse us of being people of faith. Oh, McQueen, you put faith in what you call God's word as an outline of 6,000 years of history. And I put a comma there and I say, well, snake, well, other of the evolutionists that are very commonly following Sister Erica in the circle of her friends and arguing against Christ. Are you saying there's no faith in your acceptance of the idea that you can get the evolution from amoeba to man or fish to gish, or let's throw in uh, the whole idea of biological, not I'm sorry, botanical evolution. How do you get from Bean to McQueen as a human being? Bean? How do you do that without faith? As Donnie uh, has shown as, as, as recently as the last 30 days, if you actually work through the genetics, if you work, work through the positions on the uh, DNA, you work through where do we get the X and the Y chromosome? How can we trace it? And what does it mean to have a real difference between men and women between the X and Y uh, chromosome? When you begin to go through this, there are facts that support the faith. But as we'll see, as we talk more in the second hour, when we get to uh, Darwinian evolution and we look at what Darwin and others predicted would be true about the fossil record, they would say, oh, genetics, the cell, that's all the black box to us. Show us the transitional organisms. We predict from 1859 to 1959, most of the transitional organisms will be found. And the answer is that they are simply not there. Mm -hmm. To put it perhaps bluntly to my newfound friend, Snake, Snake was not right. Snake was wrong. Donnie, uh, what do you think about that summary? Yeah, David, I'd just like to add, um, under the creation model, we can easily explain the blobs. Our contention is that the blobs are remnants a remnants of this heat absorption because under secular geology they cannot explain the existence of these massive blobs in a 4.5 billion year scenario because exactly. under that scenario those blobs should have reached equilibrium with the surrounding mantle temperature 
and they shouldn't exist. But under a young earth creation, they could easily be explained. Yeah. And As you were talking, George, earlier and giving your lecture, um, it dawned on me that next hour, Donnie, we need to talk about this whole idea of equilibrium and disequilibrium, how it applies in engineering that George has brought up, but also how it applies in metamorphic rocks. There are enormous areas of metamorphic rocks in California and in other parts of the world that are out of equilibrium. If the earth was really billions of years old, and if there were millions of years involved, these metamorphic rocks should be in equilibrium. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, Donnie, let me turn it over to you. All right, gentlemen, that was a fantastic first hour of uh, this presentation. Again, the research you gentlemen are, are doing is, is awesome, very technical. And I'm kind of mind blown over, over a lot of this research and, and data points you guys are, are doing and putting forth. And uh, the audience is loving it as well. So I do want to give a disclaimer to the audience that, of course, we're here to help any way we can. So feel free yeah. to uh, send in questions uh, even after the show, you know, through email. And, and we can um, do our best to get to those and address those. Professor McQueen, Bonnie, before uh, the hour Bonnie. break. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say before the hour break, brother, uh, because I got about 10 minutes of presentation as well that I put together. Yeah, I can do that while you're on break. And then yes, we have please. a couple of questions. You want to do the questions after break, uh, Professor McQueen? Yeah, after break. And uh, remind the audience about my uh, upcoming debate with uh, Jason Thorne, because many who have criticized your, um, thank you for putting that up, uh, Jason Torn and I have already begun to discuss and exchange resumes. This is going to be a very valuable uh, debate that will answer some of the critics' questions. But for now, Donnie, would you drop my feed and let me get a cup of coffee, and I'll be back in five minutes, okay? A well-deserved cup of coffee, Professor McQueen. So I, Now, will uh, it be an Australian five minutes or <laughs> an American five minutes? Well, we'll see. Uh, okay, take a five, take a five minute break and be back in an hour. That's the Australian. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's down under. <laughs> That's the model we live by. Okay, we'll see you in five minutes. Uh, by, uh, oh, by the I way, Donny. Uh, by the way, Donny, I didn't. I didn't uh, think my Aussie accent was so poor. Someone, <laughs> I think it was Alan Cox, mentioned that secular geology came out as sucker geology. <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> That's awesome. Well. Um, to the audience, yes. As you can see here, uh, we've got a, a, a heroic debate coming up uh, between Professor David McQueen and Jason Torn. So I'm really pumped for this. This is going to be yet another sophisticated debate. Two scientists, two well-studied, well-educated individuals here, uh, Jason Torn and David McQueen. They will be discussing uh, many of the technical aspects of the Genesis Flood and hence why the debate is titled the Genesis Flood Debate. Uh, that being said, I've been spending hours a day uh, through emails. We've got some big, capital B, uh, events for you in the, in the coming months as well. So stay tuned. Over the next couple of weeks, you should see uh, more and more events popping up. Uh, I just sat last night our two-day event on April 4th and 5th, We've got uh, the creation research team. So we are going to be joined by John Mackay and Joseph Hubbard. And we are going to be, uh, it's going to be a two day event, about two hours each show. It's going to be very interactive with the chat as well. And some very thorough and informative presentations. We're going to be talking about uh, the flood boundaries, the, the, the history of, um, sedimentation and how sedimentary layers are formed and in terms of the flood boundaries the pre the post um flood boundaries as well so it's going to be very detailed guys make sure you're there for that and i do have some stuff to present but before i do george over to you brother i know you had a few things to say and, and a couple things to add before i do that uh yeah donnie uh i i'll, I'll be very interested I, I mean i won't be in melbourne when they actually do that but um I'll be very interested in what John and Joe uh, will have uh, to present because I've seen some of their flume experiments. And just to let everybody know, um, they've actually reproduced 
anticlines, synclines, and basin layering in a flume experiment that only took 20 minutes under a scenario of varying water velocities. So that in itself def it defeats the millions of years that they say it takes um, these kind of layers to form. Absolutely fantastic. And I actually suggested to John what we should do is, is uh, and, and you can help out here with because these flumes cost money to, to build, I suggested to John, based on the tidal movements where water goes in one direction and then in low tides it goes in the reverse direction, I said, can we do a flume experiment where we can actually change the velocity of uh, not only the velocity of the water but also the direction of the, uh, the water as well to see what effect that has on the layering. So hopefully they'll take that on board. But as I said, those flumes cost money. So if you can find it in your in your pocket to donate something to to their cause, that would be fantastic. Amen. Amen. Well said. Well said, brother. Uh, okay, so let me um, cover a few things as well before uh, Professor McQueen gets back. We've been doing, as everybody knows, and check the description box of this video as well, or my community posts that I've been putting out lately. Uh, we've been doing a lot of response videos and technical oh. presentations, debunking the critics' best arguments, George, as you know. And uh, what we get in response is what? The five Ds of dodgeball. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. Uh, as we can see, we got a couple trolls in the chat not providing any real sophisticated response. Okay, so going back to this issue i did want to uh, make a few points and i'm going to share a screen i've got a couple visuals for everybody before david mcqueen gets back and i'd love your thoughts on it george as well because you guys are doing some awesome research so um let's assume there was accelerated decay at creation in the flood okay firstly accelerating decay produces heat and energy and heat and energy, at least in terms of the flood, as we've pointed out, right, George, it will help get the plates moving because these critics will say, OK, catastrophic plate tectonics, you got these meters per second movements of the plates, continental sprint rather than continental uh, drift today. Ha, ha, ha. What's the mechanism for that? But yet they're the ones that are putting forth this argument that there's too much heat and energy produced at the flood. Well, that heat and energy can be a feature and used to get the plates moving in the first place. OK, um, but specifically, I want to focus on creation. Right. The creation week obviously is an unrepeatable, unobservable event. It's it's the special creation week. Things would have been different. OK. And um, the natural processes we see today would have been greatly accelerated, most of them at creation during the creation week. You can think of something like a time lapse. I'm sure everybody has seen those videos on YouTube and, and so on and so forth, those, those cool looking uh, time lapses. And the important thing to consider, though, George, is that when it comes to the creation event, this means that the rapid or accelerated radioisotope decay, it would also mean that the amount of heat dissipation, okay, it would follow along with the accelerated radioisotope decay. And so we have heat produced, but also rapid cooling and heat dissipation. In other words, okay, in a nutshell, the rate of heat dissipation is relative to the rate of radioisotope decay. Creation week would consist of the acceleration of almost all of these natural um, processes, okay? So if you have uh, accelerated uh, radioisotope decay with heat being produced, you're also going to have um, accelerated cooling. And this is what brings me to my uh, visuals here that I want to go over, um, is the fact that we have observable evidence in the rocks themselves that there has been some kind of acceleration in the past, whether it's creation, the flood, or both, okay? And uh, this indicates, obviously, if it's creation event, a, a special creation event. And what's amazing about all the research that you and uh, Professor McQueen are, are doing is you're demonstrating that there are solutions to this so-called problem, okay? Now, I just want to cover this slide here um, on rapid nuclear decay evidence within the rocks themselves, these scars within the rocks, essentially pointing to damage 
okay, that can only be explained through some type of accelerated processes. Uranium and polonium uh, radio halos thus provide startling evidence of catastrophic geological processes on a young earth. During the year-long flood about 4,500 years ago, sediments were eroded and deposited catastrophically on a global scale. The, ca the catastrophe buried vast graveyards of plants and animals, producing fossil-bearing rock layers all over the earth. Rapid earth movements pushed up mountains and formed granite bodies quickly. Inside these granites, super fast radioactive decay generated uranium and polonium radio halos. These are so microscopic that they could be easily overlooked, but their presence in abundance in granites all around the world cannot be ignored. They are exciting confirmation that the earth and its rocks are not millions and billions of years old, as usually claimed but only about 6,000 years as God's word plainly declares in the historical narratives of Genesis. Here's why this is important. And this also goes to the, uh, the blobs you guys are referring to in your research, a strong focus uh, in your research. The fact that we don't know, uh, you know, how, how hot, what the temperature was of, of the core in, in the past, right? Indicating a lot of the heat could have been uh, sent there. But the fact that we have these cold slabs that have not warmed up or assimilated to the surrounding materials, okay? So we have all these, these numbers of lines of evidence that show there had to have been a solution or a number of solutions to the so-called heat produced during the flood or even at creation, okay? And that's where this research comes in and that's why it's so fascinating is we shouldn't have these lines of evidence if there really was this much heat being produced. That means there was obviously a way to dissipate or, or get rid of that, that heat. For example, just this, this line of evidence when it comes to radio halos and fission tracks, notice this. Since radio halos and fission tracks are obliterated at relatively low temperatures in the same way that these cold slabs would be completely melted, they'd be gone if there was no super cooling or no mechanism or solution to the so-called heat produced, right? If, if there uh, had been a heat problem due to accelerated radioactive and nuclear decay, then we should not find radio halos and fission tracks in the rocks today, but we do. But here's the thing, the evolutionists, the uniformitarians, the critics, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place because we find evidence in the rocks for damage that can best be explained through these accelerated, um, processes, right? During either creation or the flood or both. But yet the heat that they say would be a problem and precludes the global flood from, from being true would have obliterated these lines of evidence, including the cold slabs. So this right here is, is a very important point. And this brings me uh, to the cold material that we're talking about, the cold material near the Earth's core. In the early 1980s, physicist John Baumgartner, as you pointed out, uh, Brother George, developed a creationist theory for the rapid motion of the Earth's crust during the flood. His theory suggested that the cold crust located beneath the pre-flood oceans should have sunk the full 1,800 miles, uh, 2,900 kilometers, to the base of the Earth's hot mantle where the temperatures are up to 7,200 degrees Fahrenheit or 4,000 degrees Celsius. This crust would have melted if it had uh, millions of years to reach the base of the mantle, sinking as slowly as today's rates, right? These units, that's why uh, we like to point out that um, processes today, geological processes today, today cannot explain the geological features of the earth. No, catastrophic processes best explain the geologic uh, features of the earth. Okay, if these uh, plates were moving at snail pace movements through through the um, the waters, through the earth, then obviously there would have been gr significant amounts of time for these uh, slabs to have melted or at least assimilated to the, to the uh, surrounding materials. Okay, but if they were just taken down there just thousands of years ago due to rapid plate subduction during the flood year, during catastrophic plate tectonics, then of course we would expect, okay, this makes sense that they have not uh, completely melted or even warmed up. This crust would have melted if it had millions of years to reach the base of the mantle, sinking as slowly as today's rate. On the other hand, if it sank quickly 4,350 years ago, as Baumgartner's theory suggested, then piles of those plates should still be found at the base of the mantle, cooler than the mantle around them. Well, guess what? Years later, 
due to the amazing science known as uh, seismic tomography, we found this evidence. Test result, Mantle discovery. It took 10 more years before scientists developed the technology capable of seeing something like that at the base of the mantle. When that technology was developed, the cold material, the cold material fulfilled prediction of the uh, flood model that John Baumgartner is putting forth that should not exist if there really was no mechanism or some type of super cooling uh, going on during the flood to get rid of this heat. Okay. And that's why, again, this research you gentlemen are doing is, is so fascinating. Um, we're getting into the meat and potatoes of it, I guess you could say. Okay. So when that technology was developed, the cold material was discovered just as Baumgartner's model had expected. This successful prediction suggests that Baumgartner's model is true. It also suggests that continents moved rapidly during the flood and the, that the flood occurred only thousands of years ago, just as the Bible suggests. Listen, I got a coffee here. It's actually all gone. Okay. But if I got a fresh coffee, all right, so it's hot, you got steam coming out, and I put it on the, the table down here, and I toss an ice cube in, in it, right? And then I leave. Well, if my wife were to come downstairs and the ice cube is still there, not melted, then it, it's easy to conclude, okay, obviously that ice cube hasn't been in there that long. That coffee is pretty fresh as well, right? But if she were to come downstairs and there's no ice cube, it's completely melted. The um, the coffee's cold. Then obviously it's been sitting there for a lot longer. But the fact of the matter is, if the ice cube is there and it hasn't completely melted in a a uh, cup of fresh hot coffee, then obviously it hasn't been there that long. And that's exactly what we see here with these uh, with these cold slabs. The fact that they have not melted, the fact that they have not at least warmed up to the surrounding materials, suggests that they were only taken down there thousands of years ago. It's really not that difficult. Uh, to understand, but it's yet another line of evidence that the evolutionists and the uniformitarians want to dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge all over the place. So again, I just wanted to point that out, uh, Brother George, and uh, it looks like Professor McQueen is also back. So David, good to have you here. And uh, yes, that's my sense on it. That's what I wanted to present, don, gentlemen. Don, so don, any don, thoughts? Donnie, Donnie, I'm going to give you a PhD for that uh, little summary there. That was excellent. <laughs> yeah, excellent. <laughs> Uh, it made me think of a couple of things listening to you. Um, those of you that are new to what George and I consider our class or to Standing for Truth, I hope you'll find it interesting that he and I are both Christians. We're both young earth creationists. And yet we can argue about scientific points. For example, argue the difference between uh, uh, Colonel Brown's hydroplate idea and then other ideas put forward by Baumgartner and Snelling and others. I hope you occasionally sit back in your chair and say, wait, wait, my atheistic agnostic professors told me that George and David were really just preachers in disguise talking about theological points about which there could be no disagreement. And so I hope you see that we are creationists, but we are creation scientists who feel free to disagree and bounce ideas off each other. That's refreshing, isn't it, George? That's really academic freedom. Yeah, correct, correct. Uh, I was having a discussion with someone um... Actually, quite a long one. I've give, I've given up on him, but uh, we were talking about science, and I said, "Well, look, my, most um, fields of science were actually um, established by Christians." You look at um, Steno, um, uh, Mendel, uh, Newton, uh, Faraday, Maxwell. The list is so long. Yes. And uh, one of the things I said, well, you know, in, in terms of, say, the electric light bulb, uh, at the time, the advancement came outside of the candle making industry. Someone had to think something differently in a different way yeah. to invent the light bulb. So science advances from uh, thinking outside of the sciences, Yes, if that makes sense and to someone. Yeah, it does. And and one thing that we 
the three of us want our class or audience to think about is in the after discussion and in the comments section, you're going to see our critics say, oh, McQueen, oh, Bond, you two guys. Uh, this whole idea of, uh, of cold plate and equilibrium and uh, this coal rock subduction, those are all rescue devices. Uh, Donnie's accused us for years of having rescue devices for evolution. Well, I would suggest to you that if you listen carefully to what we do this week and what we and what George and I intend to do in the next 30 days, I'll let you decide, are they rescue devices or are they a legitimate scientific engineering alternative to evolutionary thought? That's a helpful way to think about it, isn't it, Donnie? Amen. Yeah, and, it, and, it, yeah and, it's, and it's based on empirical, empirical evidence. Yeah. Well, we've kept the audience waiting too long. Uh, Donnie, go ahead and uh, give us a couple of questions uh, and realize that George may have to abruptly leave. But uh, let's have a couple of questions before we go on to other issues. Amen. Sounds good. George, you've already done a fantastic job, brother. So uh, anytime you got to you got to get going, we are at the hour and 20 minute mark. Hard to believe time flies by when we are, uh, you know, discussing these important topics. So, I've, George, I've got, uh, you I've, know, I've, any I've got my phone next to me, so I'm waiting for the phone call. So I'll I'll, I'll just leave as soon as I get that phone call. OK. Perfect, brother. And for the audience sake, I know, uh, given the description box, people also came here to see the roughly 20 minutes uh, that we are going to spend, me and Professor McQueen, uh, debunking a little bit more of uh, Guts at Gibbon and uh, Mr. Wolf. Yeah, I'm looking comments. forward to that. Looking forward to that. Um, <laughs> uh, brother Donnie, would you read what cool Jews Jesus asked there? Um, Absolutely. And I'll give an answer for it from my viewpoint. Okay, well, here we go. Question that comes in from Cool Jesus. Uh, cool Jesus, very cool question. I appreciate it. So here we go. Standing for truth. What were the biblical events that caused radiometric decay? Example, Kerr slash fall, flood creation. I kind of touched on this in my presentation a bit too. So we'll, we'll, we'll get your input as well, brothers. Essentially, was there any decay pre-flood? That's an interesting question. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it is. And let me uh, bounce through that. And I'll use... Uh, my own experience with Bob Gentry back in 1973, 1974, 1975, when I was a part-time lab assistant for him. Now, Donnie did an, a wonderful job during the break, during my break, in explaining the uh, radioactive halos. We want to introduce you to as much geologic vocabulary as we can so that you have to understand that mineralogists going back into the 1800s had noticed these odd circular halos in micas and fluorites. And they called them pleochroic halos because that's a mineralogical term. When I went in uh, the period 75 to 77, the University of Michigan, the lead mineralogist there was a wonderful uh, scientist named E. William Heinrich, a, a first generation German, had a very rigorous Germanic approach to um, uh, his uh, collection there at the University of Tennessee. I'm sorry, University of Michigan. Uh, he had written books about uranium minerals and all kinds of other things. I went to him once and I said, you know, I have had, and I'd given a talk in one of his seminar series about radioactive halos. He said, you know, I've got an interest in pleochroic halos. Could you show me some from your collection? And in great Germanic fashion, within minutes, he found three or four slides, and I was able to look at them under the microscope and uh, discuss this with him. What is my point uh, on this issue? When I would go back to Bob Gentry in the 1970s and discuss this very issue that you're talking about of was there radioactive decay at creation first day, third day, at the time of the fall, 
radioactive decay before the flood and after the flood. Well, we obviously know there's radioactive decay after the flood. And I think that there was the uh, rapid decay of especially what you've heard me speak about, about polonium halos, polonium having a half-life of uh, less than 24 hours during the first day and the third day of creation. Many of my uh, Christian uh, colleagues over the years have said, well, McQueen, how can you say that when the uh, curse theologically caused the uh, breakdown of our understanding of uh, many scientific laws, but it initiated the uh, second law of thermodynamics, which is the idea of entropy, entropy or decay. Well, that's a topic for another time uh, to debate that fully. But uh, the quick answer to your question, we'll move on to the next one, is I think there's ample geologic evidence that there was radioactive decay before the flood. Back to you, Donnie. Uh, As usual, things. Professor McQueen, fantastic response to a great question. George, go ahead. What are your thoughts, brother? Uh, one of the things I was going to add is um, uh, you have to remember the Bible was written by, uh, what, 40 authors over thousands of years. Um, yes. Now, having done some statistics and those in the audience that probably understand a bit of statistics, uh, you tell me how 40 authors uh, writing over thousands of years colluded to get a statistical age of the main characters in the Bible that, that uh, fit uh, so accurately. Uh, I think it's 0.96. There's no way that, that anyone can do that over thousands of years. <laughs> you know, they can't collude to get a, a statistical yeah. analysis that accurate. And, you know, the very idea that uh, Moses and the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter uh, had a clear understanding of uh, statistics, a Gaussian distribution, standard deviation of errors. You know, it's foolish. I, this that verse, that um, body of of uh, statistics didn't come along until when creation scientists like Newton. Uh, I become a recent fan of Francis Bacon at 1620. All these men began working with the calculus and. It was not an evolutionary group of guys that came up with this. It was a group of Christian creationists who saw, saw God's hand in mathematics. So your point's well taken, George. As I said earlier, the uh, creation scientists uh, are the source of most um, of our scientific advancements. So Exactly. And, and then they so point the finger at us and say, oh, what did creation science do? <laughs> Just look around oh, you. Yeah. A lot, a lot. Okay, another question, Donnie, please. All right, here we go. Disclaimer to, uh, it, 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 I just want to point out, as always, Professor McQueen and George, we get the critics and the keyboard warriors in the chat. And it's why as a ministry, we have an outstanding uh, 2022 uh, debate challenge. So uh, it's time to step up, keyboard warriors. So I yeah. <laughs> just wanted to point that out. Okay, so the next question um comes in from let's see here okay here's uh an interesting question and i guess we'll take questions for until about the hour and a half mark and then we'll get into the fossil fuel uh portion yes, of the please. discussion so here's a question for you professor david mcqueen and of course george uh you know we always appreciate your input so uh the question is what did animals eat after the flood if the earth was covered in salt water Ah, uh, well, I, I appreciate uh, that uh, question, and it shows a misunderstanding that comes from a lot of Sunday schools teaching false doctrine. Let me expand on that. If you ask a lot of people, and I have asked a lot of people in my 50 years worth of interest in this topic, oh, tell me about Noah's flood. Well, Dr. Henry Morse always used to say, now, wait, wait. It was not Noah's fault. It's the Genesis flood. So we'll call it uh, that, the worldwide flood. How long did it last? Well, so many people say, oh, 40 days and 40 nights. Well, it shows an ignorance 
of actually reading as if it, the Bible could communicate truth, Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, and keep on going, but especially 6, 7, and 8. The flood lasted a full year. To generalize, the floodwaters um, descended and eroded a tremendous amount of igneous and metamorphic material and buried it with fossils during the time of the flood during the first six months. But people forget that once the flood floodwaters rose and the uh, rain stopped, the chemistry of the rain at the very top of that water column, the salt water was uh, underneath it, the chemistry of the rain at the top of that, as it descended all over the earth, as the continents were rising and so forth, would have um, produced enormous areas of fresh water, uh, Green River Basin, Green, Green Eocene, Green River fish fossil localities, a good e example. And these fish were not stupid. As they began to feel the salinity rise in one area, they would go to areas of lower salinity. And so as the floodwaters completely recited, uh, receded <laughs> as the flood went on, these freshwater fish were caught in freshwater lakes. Now, so that, that's the most important point. The, entol the entire earth, the entire, what, if you're in an, if you understand agronomy, the A, B, and C level of soils, the idea that all of that was a brine, a saline brine, where there was no fresh groundwater or anything for Noah and the animals to eat, is a naive and narrow way of viewing it. That would be my answer, uh, Donnie. And and, uh, and David, let's not forget uh, so the salt water content in the oceans is actually good empirical evidence for a young Earth. Um, no one is uh, suggesting that the um, water at the time of the flood had the same salt content as it does today. So um, yeah. that's a, probably a false assumption to make uh, because if you look at the the rate of soil deposition in, in into the oceans today, uh, yes. it, they can't they can't account for the billions of years. Uh, we, we would have a um, an ocean so full of salt that nothing could survive in it. Now, the young science students that are watching this that are in your 20s and 30s and 40s, right in the beginning and the mid part of your career, I hope you can see the value of having creation clubs all over the world, Eastern Australia, Canada, here in the U.S., so that people of like mine, like George and me and Donnie, can bounce ideas off of each other, like he just suggested that I was overlooking perhaps the salinity of the of what I call Noah's Ocean. A very uh, a very good point. Keep that in mind uh, that we uh, are colleagues discussing legitimate models scientifically. Go ahead. Great points, uh, gentlemen. Okay, let's move on to a couple super chats we got in. Not necessarily questions, but uh, because they are uh, donations, uh, showing some love and support for the channel. I appreciate it, guys. You you are the life and blood of this channel. So uh, you Amen. keep the research going. God bless you. So this one comes in from Alec Cox, $20 super chat. And he says, uh, Evo illusion is a logical disease put forth by propagandist pulpits of academia. If one goes astray and tells the truth, going against the evolutionary story, evil illusion, they are chastised, fired, demoted, and I'm guessing there's more to this, or, or excommunicated. So I, I appreciate right. that, uh, Alex. So true. Right. <laughs> well, well so let, true. Me, let me uh, uh, thank Alec. Uh, you know, George and I are uh, every Christmas – paid 100 Chinese yen uh, for all that we do during the preceding year. And I've done the math, George, uh, uh, up until recently, that's $16 a year 
100 Chinese yen. So I'm <laughs> thankful. Uh, Alex, uh, donation covered my part of it at least. But let's not joke. Let's go on to uh, the, Dave, the important point. David, don't forget the, compounding yeah. interest. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, the um, I got distracted there thinking Sorry. of a trillion dollars, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> the, um, um, the point I'm trying to focus on here for this uh, for this discussion is that um, I have been denied my doctorate over the academic pressure against someone that's a Darwin doubter. I lost my job as a, that I enjoyed as a university professor at Virginia State University in the early 80s because I was a Darwin doubter and presumed to be part of the Arkansas creation evolution trial. So what you say about being excommunicated from the ivory towers of Harvard is true. Let me finish with one anecdote. My dear friend, Dr. Ken Cumming, an ichthyologist with a PhD from Harvard University. I love it. PhD from Harvard University in ichthyology. When he would go out and debate, you know, they couldn't say anything about Harvard. You know, they could call the University of Michigan like a Midwestern trade school, but they couldn't say anything about Harvard. And so what <laughs> they would do is they would just take his degree away, but they will say, I love what you would come back and report and say, well, at least he's been introduced to the truth <laughs> at Harvard. That's good. I appreciate that, uh, Professor McQueen. Um, George, it looks like there's one last clarifying question. And then, uh, as always, these are th these are so much fun. Uh, maybe we'll get to the uh, fossil fuel uh, portion of it. Yeah, why let's, don't we, oh. let's take uh, this um, cool Jesus question for George, and then we'll go on to... Uh, Erica and her circle of minions. <laughs> uh, cool. Jesus says, George, can you, can, it's true. It's true. George, can you confirm my summary creation day three rapid decay for 12 to 18 hours, then normal decay up to the flood, rapid decay, one year flood, post flood, normal decay. Is that right? Um, and, and any thoughts or opinions on that uh, gentlemen? Well, I'd like to ask, where does he get that from? Uh, I specifically stated that we can address the um, the rapid decay through fusion uh, or Z-pinch, if you want to call that, or, or cold repacking. Uh, it's observable science. We, we've observed it through um, lightning strikes. Uh, we've observed it in the laboratory where we fire uh, concentrated laser beams at uh, metals like uh, iron and gold and, and titanium, and we can produce those uh, heavier elements um, uh, with the same, with the same uh, uh, rates, mm -hmm. parent, parent to daughter rates, as we find them in the natural environment. And uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Now I was reading, <laughs> I was reading some of the stuff that you were That's okay. I have something to interject here, uh, yeah. if I may. Yeah, uh, to more fully study this, go ahead and give me full screen here so I can show them the books here. And, and Professor be McQueen, well, before you do, I, I just wanted to reiterate one quick point. Take 10 oh, seconds. Okay. No is, is for anybody in the audience, you know, I covered this for about uh, 15 minutes earlier, is our team here, specifically Professor McQueen and George Bond, are... Um, you know, doing active research, fantastic research, by the way, in um, answering the details uh, and some of the unknowns of, of the flood and uh, mechanisms for getting rid of the heat and, and looking into different heat sinks and stuff. But the point is the observations that we also point to, like the damage in the rocks that we find, the cold slabs, the blobs. OK, it's important to note, and this is something the critics dodge, including Guts of Gibbon. I mean, hardcore dodge. These observations that are not in accord with uniformitarian or actualism thinking <coughs> and models should not exist <laughs> if there really was as much heat 
or as much of a problem that the uh, evolutionists want to say. For example, here, I want to reiterate this and then I'll end. Since radio halos and fission tracks, and let's also now put in the blobs and uh, this cold material, okay, are obliterated at relatively low temperatures. If there had been a heat problem due to accelerated radioactive and nuclear decay, then we should not find uh, in this specific uh, citation radio halos and fission tracks, but also, um, the, the, the cold material in the blob. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Go yeah, ahead. Don, Don, Donnie, oh. Donnie, uh, uh, just, just one moment, David. Uh, yeah. Donnie, the, the super heavy elements, and, and I emphasize super heavy, under, under an old earth situation, they should all be down into the core because super, super heavy means super heavy and they will sink down to the core. So why why is it that we find super heavy elements in the crust when the when the Earth was a molten ball of rock for five hundred million to a billion years and then cooled down? I mean that's that's silly. It's I, I keep saying these, these questions that that come up are actually shooting yourself in the foot because if you look at your own alternative explanation, you cannot explain it. Yeah, that's all I have to add to that. Okay, and then I'll add just one thing. Uh, the lazy students in the audience that haven't been doing their homework really need to give up a, a few mocha lattes at Starbucks and save up your money and buy these two volumes. This, by Dr. Snelling, is a source of understanding, for example, that question, was there any radioactive decay on day three? pre-flood, post-flood, pre-fall, post-fall. Uh, they're covered in books like this. That's all, Donnie. Hey, hey, hey David, do, 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 do those two volumes come in audio form? Because I've got a hundred other books I have to read. That's okay. Um, I don't <laughs> I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm going to have David McQueen make audio books out of them. So you're going to be a busy oh, no, man. I'm going you're to need lots of... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to hire Erica to read it word word by word. Let's go on to uh, the issues of geology and petroleum now. Uh, Professor McQueen, question here from Ashley Myers. Uh, she asks, "Can you post those book names?" Yeah, I, I can put them in the description box. It was Earth's catastrophic past, right? Yeah, and then exactly. um, volume one and okay. two. Yeah, yeah, volume one and two. By and Snelling. These uh, these are by Snelling. And volume one came out in 2009. Both of them came out in 2009. Okay. Okay. I've now. actually got that book on, on, on the way to my house because I ordered Dr. Nathaniel Jensen's new book with confirmed predictions based on uh, what you were talking about earlier, Professor McQueen, uh, the Y chromosome yeah. mitochondrial DNA. Yeah, so right. that should be at the house soon. I'm excited. And I also got uh, Dr. Snelling's book coming as well. So that now, being said, the way I'd like to, the way I'd like to work this is like we did it last time. Sure. Go to the geologist uh, email to you and read me a few sentences and then I'll respond and then read me some more and I'll respond again. That's Let's good. do it that way. Okay, Donnie? Now, I, I want to point out for the audience sake, since we like to show both sides of the argument, which we've been doing. Uh, check the description box of this video. I've put uh, the previous three or four parts of uh, fossil fuel and uh, the fossil fuel industry. And apparently, according to, you know, Guts of Gibbon, it's one of the number one arguments against uh, young earth creation. So you can find the previous parts to that. You can read, uh, you know, their go-to guy, uh, Mr. Wilford here. You can read his rebuttals and um, you should be able to see objectively. They're not very good. He's, he's not really, I, I've gone through them all and that's why we're doing these. And he hasn't really responded to much of what uh, Professor McQueen has said. And so you guys can check that out for yourselves, though. So we'll, we'll read through a little bit more of the, his latest response. Uh, but he did kind of die. He, he, admittedly, he kind of points that out, that he's not going to address uh, some of Professor McQueen's arguments. So let's start here. Professor McQueen, I'll read one paragraph and, and we'll make some okay. points. So. And as you read, I'll get the board erased, ready to draw some pictures. Beautiful. Beautiful. Great job. Great work, guys. So here we go. Regarding Yun or Yun AL 2010, who again state that knowing the timing of oil migration is crucial for predicting where to look 
for new prospects. And according to him in brackets, are backed up by other references I have provided. McQueen now responds, okay, this was our latest response we did, by saying that while it may be the case that people who do basin analysis are called in to help make a such predictions, the people who perform BPSM are only a small part of the team making the predictions as a whole. In other words, he wants to say their role is minor at best and could probably be discarded with without much economic impact. Yet the literature Erica and I have already cited emphasizes time and time again that their role is quite important in making such predictions rather than being a minor component. Um, do you want to stop there, Professor McQueen? Give some thoughts? Yeah, let's do it that way. Because I love this argument because since I was first challenged by uh, Erica and her, uh, the people in orbit around her, I have actually called some uh, friends of mine that are either uh, still in the petroleum industry or recently retired, petroleum engineers, geologists, and others, to ask about, okay, if we suspect that there is a new um, supergiant field offshore Nigeria, how does a major company Shell, Exxon, BP, Royal Dutch Shell. How do they decide to invest the millions of dollars that it takes there? Well, let's uh, let's look at this chart here. At the top of every business, and I'm not being critical. This is legitimate. At the top of every business, you've got managers that have the stock payers' money right in front of their eyes. And they want to know some way to be able to find a supergiant field and make some money of it and not drill what's called a dry hole where you go down and you find nothing having spent millions of dollars in uh, uh, an area that there's no petroleum. So basin analysis, A-N-A-L-Y-S-I-S, is one component, I would argue, of 10 that these managers want to see when the 20 people come into the big penthouse conference room to decide, are we going to spend any money on um, offshore Nigeria? Well, who else is there? Well, you've got petroleum engineers who evaluate how much money in a sandstone, a shale, or a limestone, or a sand or a salt dome it's going to take to uh, drill. And then you've got the actual drilling companies. And if you have not watched uh, the either documentaries or Hollywood movies dealing with the uh, Deepwater Horizon disaster and the relationship between one of the groups that gave me a scholarship as an undergraduate student at Tennessee, Schlumberger, or uh, the uh, Halliburton, and the relationship between them and BP, and then the actual drilling company, the people that have built this offshore rig, they can really go 100 miles off uh, the west coast of Nigeria to drill down 20,000 feet, they're part of it. And you go on down the list here, and you've got uh, uh, traditional stratigraphers and geologists. And then my argument is you come to this very important group that I'll put S for Superman. It actually stands for seismic. All over the Earth, all over the Earth's oceans and on land too, but let's, let's talk about offshore Nigeria. All over that enormous area in the Atlantic Ocean, for decades, ships have moved along the surface, and those ships can be illustrated by this block of my grandchildren. So you got this ship going across, and underneath it, it is dangling down what are called hydrophones. 
And so off in some distance here from the ship, all these hydrophones are coming out. And then a particular ship, boom, lets off a, an enormous explosion. And it sends a, a wave of uh, energy down into uh, 1,000, 10,000, 20,000 feet worth of uh, uh, of uh, sediment. For those of you that think that I never did teach petroleum geology, let me put a 30-second caveat in there. I actually know the difference between an unmigrated seismic section and a migrated seismic section. Do you? Do the critics of what I'm saying understand enough of how they could, enough about geophysics that they could even understand why I would use vocabulary like migrated, unmigrated? Well, unmigrated is not corrected for certain physical characteristics of sediments. A migrated section is. That's a little technical aside for those of you that seem to disbelieve I actually know anything about um, petroleum geology. So now, my argument, and it remains until you find someone that's a retired engineer from someplace, my argument remains is that while the senior manager does want to see a basin analysis, he wants a comment about where the source rocks for the crude oil might be, how did they migrate into the reservoirs where they are? He does want that uh, sort of information. I think that can be found, that can be provided by catastrophic sedimentary logic. But I'll put that to one side. This manager sitting up here with the money, he wants a basin analogist, analogy. I'm sorry. He wants a basin analysis. I get excited. I can't talk anymore. <laughs> He wants petroleum engineering. He wants the drilling companies okay. Everybody is thinking back to Deepwater Horizon and the nightmare that was. Um, you've got to have traditional structural geology, traditional stratigraphy, but it all comes back to seismic. Why? Because the goal of petroleum engineering, petroleum geology, since Drake drilled the first well in Pennsylvania in 1859, has been the direct detection of crude oil underneath the ground without having to drill it. That's what I call the holy grail of petroleum geology. That's where you make the real money. Now, there are some terms that, are, that have been used uh, that are called bright lining um, it's a way to look at a seismic section and at least make an educated guess about um, where the natural gas would be. In talking to a retired petroleum engineer, um, he told me, he said, um, McQueen, have you ever heard about uh, effervescent water? I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, if you look down in one of these basins, let me move this so you can see this area over here and let me erase it. Um, the, uh, if you go to one of these basins and people start talking about bright lining and, and all the different things that are involved in it, sometimes you get this situation. You get a situation where you're 10,000 feet down in the Gulf of Mexico and you see this bright line there that's a, really an indication of natural gas. And then when you go with great amounts of money and convince your manager and you actually drill this thing, again, here's my tree. This is a cross section. You drill this thing. It turns out that that's natural gas, maybe a few hundred cubic feet of natural gas in water underneath the ground, which is called conate water. And so it's almost like Alka-Seltzer bubbling uh, in a glass. It tricks the hydrophones and the seismic into thinking, oh, man, we got a gazillion cubic feet of natural gas here. Well, actually, all you've got is some 
uh, bubbles coming through um, conate water. The senior managers come apart when the team, now these are, these are not a bunch of undergraduate uh, students here. These men are people that have been in the industry for 30, 40 years maybe. Many of them are not quite my age at 70, but they're getting close. So when guys like this make a $100 million mistake, that's a big deal. Do you oh, yeah. find that helpful, Donnie? Yeah, the other, thing I'll, I, the other thing I'd like to add to that, uh, Professor McQueen, is uh, as, as John Mackay says, it's not about time, it's about process. Mm. And uh, we can explain all of these things by process. Uh, quick burial, layering by moving water, the, the, the so-called heat, it, it can be used there to turn it Thank into you, coal, into the gas, into the oil, etc. So, yeah, that's right. as he keeps saying, it's not about um, time, it's about the process. Okay, Donnie, go to another paragraph in that critic and let's uh, answer that. I do want to say I completely agree with Michael Knighton, brother. McQueen, you are the man. I don't know where you got all this knowledge, yeah. but I'm just glad we're on the same page. No, team. no. No, look. See, I'm the Batman. Where's my <laughs> camera? Here? See, I'm the Batman. I've been down in the Batcave for 50 years now thinking about it. If you think about anything <laughs> for 50 years, uh, you know, let's say you, you thought about comic book collecting. In 50 years, you ought to stumble across <laughs> at least. One thousand dollar comic book. Go ahead. <laughs> and, and Donnie, I'd like to say, be, behind a great professor of geology is a great retired engineer. Oh, <laughs> Amen. we would never Amen. minimize engineering. Oh, <laughs> Lord Jesus, help us all. And uh, behind a great Batman, the Batman being Professor McQueen, lies a great Alfred and a great Robin. Which is oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then uh, did all you these people, all these people in orbit around Erica, they're the Joker and the Penguin and all these other, uh, you know, <laughs> Erica thinks the Penguin evolved from bats, probably. <laughs> well, let's not give them too much credit with I the don't Joker. Mean, they're more, I don't yeah, mean like the Penguin. Too <laughs> Erica, I they're more like the mind. cronies that work for the Joker. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so, let's go so, ahead. What's hey, the next hey, question? I, 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 Donny does. Sucker geology mean they are sucker geologists? Oh, <laughs> yeah. You can't even pronounce the word blob correctly. Don't even worry about sucker. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll try harder next time. Yeah, well, no gentlemen, problem. did you want to give question. a... Uh, yeah, did you want to I'm give sorry. a real quick answer to this clarifying question before I read the next portion? It's from Jeremy Nolan. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. No and, problem, And he Jeremy. asked... I appreciate the question, uh, Jeremy. Uh, again, we're here to help any way we can. We're here to serve. So Jeremy asks, question, isn't most water underground cold like well water? Wouldn't most water coming up during the flood be cold? He says, thanks, brother. Well, uh, George gave the best answer to this early on. If you look at the, uh, let me get the, the curved piece that I had. What did I do with it? curved piece um oh there it is i think yeah here we go uh imagine this curve here to be the upper mantle crust boundary well the evidence that we have from what's called the geothermal gradient is it really does get hotter as you go down in the earth the perfect example is the real heat problem that diamond mines in South Africa have, because as the miners go deeper and deeper, uh, it gets hotter and hotter. It's a real, a real problem. So there, there is no question that the earth is hotter as you go down deeper. If we're saying that catastrophic plate tectonics occurred and that one world continent broke up above this, um, the water is not going to be like, uh, groundwater from 400 feet down in eastern Australia or in the southern United States or in southern Canada. It's true that in our modern context, that um, uppermost aquifer, that aquifer water is going to be cooler than uh, what it might be heated up in the, in the surface. But 
If you go back geologically to the biblical model of the worldwide flood, what do we have as a focus? The fountains of the great deep breaking up. Now that was water and no question about it, but also we now realize as 21st century flood geologists that those were fountains of lava moving to the surface too. So uh, the, the water should not be cold. It should be hot. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. We'll move on to the next uh, portion. Before I do, Ashley Myers gives a $5 super chat. Again, thank you so much there, Ashley. She says, Make it, uh, makes me physically ill as a science teacher that science teachers are not doing their due diligence by presenting all viable theories to students. Amen. Well said. Well said. I agree with that. And I have a follow-up on what Ashley says, but I'll wait sure. for you to prompt me, uh, Donnie. Yeah, go ahead, Professor McQueen. Yeah. I, I was a high school science teacher in a large public school in the 88-89 school year. I had a lot of information coming into the classroom so I could present a two-model approach. The problem that 21st century high school, public school teachers have is they are being asked to solve the world's problems. You have a group of diverse young people coming in after COVID. Many of those young people um, were behind a year in their um, uh, math and science background. They, they come from increasingly broken and dysfunctional families, which increases the level of disobedience. And so the reason a lot of teachers can't present all the viable theories is they can bury they can barely manage classroom discipline and all the other social issues that if you go back a hundred years was handled by the family, not by uh, a public school. So that's my say on that, Donnie. Well said. Well said, Professor McQueen. Okay. Let's, uh, this has been fantastic so far. What a great show. Uh, guys, please share around this content because as I like to point out the truth, is is so important and so is critical uh, thinking so okay let's go to the next portion uh professor mcqueen i gotta confess i really enjoy these responses and, and you do such a great well, job good. i enjoy listening to what the gentleman says credit where credit is due guts it given you know she provides great job security <laughs> so i'll give her that uh, <laughs> since there's endless content to refute <laughs> so okay moving on uh, he, referring to Professor, Professor McQueen, then says that in many cases, the Trump card, quote unquote, in making an actual drilling decision once structural leads are found is the geophysical data surrounding that prospect. Because if they cannot show with confidence a new seismic lead is a genuine trap, then is a seismic lead or, or seismic lead? So seismic lead is It'd a genuine a seismic lead. Yeah, seismic lead is a genuine trap. Then drilling will not be conducted. That's true, of course. In situations where the timing data shows that lead would be charged, assuming it is a genuine trap, but the seismic data supporting that the structure was sufficient for trapping oil is questionable. Petroleum geologists are likely to abandon that lead. But this has no relevance to the matter of actually predicting what parts of the basin new prospects should be searched for in the first place, as his doodled example deals with a situation where a lead has already been located and is undergoing prospect evaluation. Rather than dealing with predicting prospecting regions like the UNAL in 2010 was discussing. Additionally, it is also true that in many other cases during individual prospect evaluation, like his example illustrates, the trump card in making a dr drilling decision is actually the play assessment and not the seismic data. For in I'll, I'll finish this paragraph and we'll end it. For instance, cases where seismic validation confirms a trap is present, but the play analysis says the timing of oil migration ceased before a given trap formed. Such a lead is also likely to be abandoned or at least put on the back burner until less risky prospects have been drilled. 
Again, nobody denies that the geophysical component of the data is extremely important for making a drilling decision, yet the literature is clear that it is equally important to make sure the seismic data is validated by the play assessment and that when the two do not agree, a drilling decision should not be made. That's a mouthful and we'll end it there. <laughs> okay, let's go back and uh, make uh, to our class, to our audience, some of this vocabulary clear so you can see what we're talking about. Um, over and over again, those that feed information to Erica and her group have focused on some variation of what is called basin analysis. And I'll simply abbreviate that by BA, um, basin analysis. Notice the vocabulary that was used tonight. It's called play analysis. Now, this is kind of insider petroleum geology vocabulary. Uh, if you're talking at lunch with a group of petroleum geologists and they, uh, they ask me, they say, well, McQueen, I hear on the internet that you think that near Delhi, Louisiana, uh, you may have a play there for a uh, pinch out of smack over sediments, uh, producing a structural trap. Um, tell us about the play. Well, what they mean by that is they're expecting me to go into my attache case and pull out what I'm going to show you in the future. Our group, it's a group of paperwork that is. Um, see, they're, they're called logs, L-O-G-S. And in an old oil field like uh, this uh, Delhi gas field that I believe, based on catastrophic sedimentation, coming off of the waters receding from the uh, uh, Washita and Ozark Mountains in Arkansas, that there may have been some petroleum there, uh, I would have to show the people at the oil company a group of these logs. And these logs have kind of squiggly lines on them. And those squiggly lines mean a certain thing. Uh, they mean... Uh, the resistivity of the water as you go down. Uh, you can run a log that would uh, tell you the amount of uh, you, uh, radioactive content in clays. Let me use a different color for a clay here, a red. And so these different logs would tell you what is, uh, what is there. That is what is meant by a play analysis. And... For someone like me that's an independent petroleum geologist, I don't need millions of dollars to do my play in northern Louisiana, but I do need hundreds of thousands of dollars to hire local dealers to help me to do this. And so I could, based on my catastrophic flood geology basin analysis, go into this play and do something. But the argument that senior uh, petroleum engineers and petroleum geologists at major oil companies, and I use Shell just as an example, it could be BP or whatever it is. Um, the reason that my argument about this play analysis and basin analysis involves geophysics is this. It's one thing to say, if I've got several billion dollars for research, I might spring for a hundred thousand for an independent uh, geologist to give me an idea. But if you're going to spend one hundred million dollars, I don't care what kind of Blay analysis you've got. I don't care what kind of basin analysis you've got. If you don't have a good seismic sec section. Now, this is an anticline here. 
And underneath that incline, we're suspecting there's oil and gas, and there's going to be water also that has migrated, M-I-G-R-A-T-E-D, migrated from what's called a source rock, S-C, deposited catastrophically in the flood. This petroleum has migrated in there. Well, how are you going to convince the money managers my argument is, no matter what this says, if you don't have good seismic across this that shows you a seismic line going across this anaclinal structure, um, the senior managers won't spring for it. And so the argument that uh, uh, our opponent here is building is exactly backwards. It's not that... Basin analysis guides geophysics is that geophysics verifies, justifies, and confirms a basin analysis. Okay, next question, my friend. That's another great response, Professor McQueen. Um, I want to be cognizant and respectful of your time. We are at the two hour and nine minute mark, believe it or not. Um, therefore, did you want to wrap up now? Did you want to do one last no, portion? No, no, it's, it's only 7.30, plenty of coffee left. Let's go another 30 minutes, okay? <laughs> hey, I am impressed over the endurance and endless energy, Professor McQueen. So, okay, let's well, go I'm to the to let's go to the next portion here. So, uh, share screen and all right. Uh, actually, looks like we're almost done this this whole next section. So, just a walk in the park for Professor McQueen. <laughs> well, you can do this I'm with half your brain that, tied behind your back. You know. Now, let me make a quick comment here. Uh, God has given me experience going all the way back to my first job as a geologist, uh, as a field assistant, to a man who was a petroleum geologist back actually in my senior year in high school. So. Um, uh, I've been interested in this for 52 years. And so you got to learn something in 52 years. Go ahead with the question there, my friend. Well said. Okay, so here we go. He's got a, a citation from a paper here in 2016 from Nanda. It is also equally important to evaluate the prospect in the context of the overall geological perspective in the area for reduction of exploration risk. The seismic validation and the geological play assessments must be mutually compatible before making a drilling decision. Of course, this should not be the case if McQueen was right that play analysis only plays a very minor, minor role in making such predictions slash decisions. Remember, and a couple papers here, um, Simmons or Simons 2020 and 2021 note, play assessments care heavily about the depositional history of the basin, including absolute age of the rocks within it. Nanda 2016 is also supported by the testimony of Faded Glory, who noted to me that without such models supporting the viability of a prospect, the companies he worked for would not allow a well to be drilled. And instead of going over this citation here, let's just end it here with McQueen's claim that role of those who do basin modeling and play analysis is minor and fairly unimportant, simply finds no support in the technical literature. That pretty much sums up all this. And personal speculation slash anecdote are not good enough to support such an accusation. Professor McQueen, what are your thoughts on that, brother? Okay, that raises a, a remarkable uh, point. Uh, we are dedicating 2022 to a challenge to evolutionary biologists to counter the idea of uh, DNA, to counter the idea of being able to predict how many generations you go back on a Y uh, chromosome and so forth. Why don't we plan in 2023 to offer the same challenge to these senior geologists that are apparently advising uh, the junior members. Why don't they agree to come on and debate me? If they're retired uh, professional geologists, uh, let's get in the ring. Let's put the gloves on. 
tell me, tell me why it's not right. Now, let me uh, point out a very important issue in that last uh, group of uh, conversation. You know, he, he said, he went on and on about, oh, we have to know when we go in a certain area, we need to know whether that's uh, Mesozoic, if I can make a Z there, Paleozoic rocks. We need to stay away from the Precambrian rocks because there was no evolution going on there. But wait, but wait. There is a play involving a part of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which uh, is around Chattanooga, Tennessee, and to the north and to the south. There is a play there in which uh, you've got tremendous faulting going on during the time of the Great Flood, where you have uh, pre-flood rocks. Uh, let me use a different vocabulary here. This vocabulary is based on evolutionary assumptions. Let's use Bible assumptions and the work of Snelling and others. And let's talk about creation week rock, um, flood phase one, flood phase two. And so let's use that vocabulary. Well, in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, there's an area where igneous metamorphic rocks are thrust above uh, rocks uh, that would be called um, part of the salk sequence and then on up into a group of rocks that if you're knowledgeable of carbonates, this is uh, KNOX, this is the Knox group of rocks. These are Cambria division rocks. The point is this creation week rock is on front, on, on top of that. And so Lynn Harris, one of the geologists I work for, showed me a science, seismic section back in the early 70s that the um, oil companies had shot across the Great Smoky Mountains, and it showed potential underneath um, what they would consider to be Precambrian rocks. Now, isn't that interesting that a flood geology model might lead you to explore some places where an evolutionary model would not lead you. Okay, so that's half of that answer. The other half of the answer runs this way. Notice that he made a, a bunch of comments in there about how, and we've talked about this before regarding some of those citations that he uh, gives there. Um, the petroleum geologist will do a preliminary look once again, we've got a cross section here. And let's think that this is West Texas, for example. They'll take a preliminary look and they'll uh, be able to go down and get some samples at, say, a thousand feet. And then they'll pick two elements, uh, two isotopes of oxygen, two other elements from the periodic table. And so we can uh, call it oxygen isotope, or we can just use the word E for an element one. They're going to do a ratio with element two. And so they make a big deal and have made a big deal in criticizing my thinking that until you show these senior managers this oxygen-oxygen ratio or the ratio between two elements that they won't be able to accept a play analysis or a basin analysis that's not tied in to the traditional geologic thinking about Precambrian, Paleozoic, Cenozoic, I'm sorry, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, tied into the evolutionary timescale of thinking. Well, the critique of that uh, is fascinating. And let me uh, uh, say it anecdotally so that those of you that don't have degrees in geology can understand it. It's not as if these 10 men go into this big conference room 
And one of them gets up and says, oh, for heaven's sakes, we know that this group of rocks here is Paleozoic. And we know that all kinds of gastropods or snails and plesiopods, which are clams, evolved during that period of time. Shazam, Andy, let's go look there because the evolutionary viewpoint would say that where you've got all this evolution go, going on, you've got all these decayed remains of, uh, of uh, uh, clams and snails. That should be a remarkable source rock. It should be a remarkable reservoir rock for um, finding a crude oil. Well, it cannot be further from the truth. If you go to uh, areas that have tremendous resources and reserves of crude oil, like offshore Louisiana, offshore Mississippi, way out into the Gulf of Mexico, and you actually look at the way that the old-time petroleum geologists evaluated these areas. They didn't need ratios between two uh, isotopes of oxygen. They didn't need ratios between two elements from the periodic table. What did they need? They needed history, pragmatic petroleum engineering. So here's the Gulf of Mexico. And here's a ship up here with a tree on it to show that I'm drawing a cross section. And so you go down and drill. And over the last hundred years, it's been found that fossil number two and fossil number one in the Gulf of Mexico are separated by about a thousand feet. Let me get here this thousand foot thick uh, zone. The evolutionary community would say, oh, fossil two, uh, called a foraminifera or foram, evolved from fossil number one. And the old time petroleum geologists would laugh. They would say, oh, no, we just simply have experience that when we find fossil number two, if we go a couple hundred feet down underneath it at a faulted zone, we can find some crude oil. My Yale university-trained stratigraphy professor in 1974 put this chart up on the board and he said to all of us, all 20 of us, he said, these two fossils might as well be a screw that you use to attach wallboard or a bolt that you put on your refrigerator to uh, uh, attach a part in the back they might as well be screws, paper clips, bolts, as well as these forams, because it's practical experience. Wherever you find this bolt here, I ought to draw a bolt there, I guess. You go 100 feet down and you generally find crude oil. But if you go all the way down to where you find these uh, wood screws and sheet, uh, sheetrock screws, you're not going to find any crude oil down there. It's pragmatic micropaleontology. Okay, that helpful, you think, Donnie? Is that okay, Donnie? Are you there someplace? I think well, he might, might be relieving himself. Okay. Uh, probably all that water okay. that he's been drinking. <laughs> no, I'm, yes, I'm okay. Well, let me. I'm, uh, okay. I, I, uh, I, I sped away like the flash there for about 10 seconds and it turned out that's when you Oh, ended, that's so. another comic book. Uh, that's what I'm <laughs> going to do with the flash, Superman. Uh, I uh, am coming up on the two and a half hour mark here, I think. So can I make a five minute closing statement and then George is still here by God's grace and he can too. Uh, George has challenged me to begin to memorize Bible verses that we can end our time with that would give a real focus to the biblical creationism as well as the scientific creationism. So let's start with one of the uh, uh, best known, and that's Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the foundation of the entire Bible, actually. 
Well, I love this part here. Now notice that this is a uh, trans catheter heart valve. And many of you may actually have one of these in your body or at least know. Notice that it's called a Sapien 3. I guess that's so it goes into humans, not apes or something. Uh, and this heart valve is the white, it almost looks like a crown there in the middle. And it's a part that's uh, inserted in an artery and then opens up to open up that artery and uh, allow the blood to flow. This would be called in some circles a kind of stent, although this is different. This is a replacement for a heart valve and uh, very elaborate. Now, why would I even bring this up? The heart valve that this is replacing is the heart valve that through DNA, God put in human bodies. And so as we're growing in the womb, and then we have the reveal of, uh, of the baby being born, this heart valve is an evidence, objective evidence, I would argue, for creative design. But how? The fact that a human with a lot of experience can uh, invent a replacement to it, that is intelligent design from an engineering standpoint. And so if we can put in our bodies valves like this that have been engineered by bioengineering. Why is it so hard to believe that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and that he's the first cause of all this? That would be my summary. I'll turn it over now to George. Well, Amen. sorry, I've got Amen. the phone call coming. Sorry about that. Okay, no I'll worries. turn it over to Donnie then. Well, gentlemen, fantastic show. It's hard to believe that it's been two and a half hours. Again, the endurance uh, from the both of you uh, is impressive. I appreciate it. Uh, Professor McQueen and George, you guys are doing some awesome research. To the audience, thank you so much for so many great questions. And the next show that we do with uh, David and George, we will, uh, as we have been doing, we'll uh, spend again another 30 minutes responding to uh, Mr. Wilford's comments because it is a ton of fun. And you know how we love to leave no stone unturned yeah. and address and all the critics. One arguments. thing I want to comment before you drop my video is George was uh, working so hard on the engineering physics that we didn't get a proper number of uh, um, jokes told. And so uh, <laughs> let me end with a joke. Now, this is a joke that my own grandchildren don't even like, so why not tell it to Donnie? You know, that's, that's what I say. Um, you know, my, my name is David McQueen. But you know, Danny, last week I lost my wallet and I lost my ID, so you can just call me Dab now. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> that's good. Hey, hey laughter is uh, the best medicine, and that's how we like well, to start the shows. I can hear them. half these people groaning. Uh, with your permission, my friend, I'm going to exit out of the program, and our next uh, approach will be at the debate, will it not? So that'll be Amen, good. Amen, brother. Amen. So, good uh, night. Queen, good night. Yes. Thank you so much. And we're going to let you get out of here. And George had his important phone call. So it is now just me. Uh, again, George and David, great job. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very um, happy and imp Im impressed with, with all the work being done by the various members of this team. Uh, we have brothers George Bond and uh, Professor David McQueen doing a lot of behind the scenes work and research when it comes to flood geology and, of course, their active uh, research program here on the heat problem. Uh, Matt and myself, we are spending a ton of time focusing on uh, our model of separate ancestry as well as um, doing our best to get this human evolution handbook out for everybody, it is going to be thorough and it will be the most up-to-date book on human evolution that you can buy. So uh, guys, we appreciate your support. I've noticed we've got a lot of new patrons 
And again, to any new patrons, uh, we are sending you three uh, free PDFs of any of our many books. So again, you guys are the life and blood of this channel, and I greatly appreciate it. So a couple of reminders and actual updates. So we're, we're, we're coming to the end of the first quarter of 2022. We put the Evolution Debate Challenge out at the end of 2021, and uh we knew it'd be a lot of fun. We just didn't know it'd be this much fun. Uh, we've been doing two or three debates a week uh, on the Evolution Debate Challenge. There has been, uh, out of it, as a result of it, we've, we've set a couple new records. Uh, for example, this epic debate uh, was a ton of fun. I think it's almost at 10,000 views right now. Tom Jump and Kent Hoven. As well as uh, the following week, we set another record. I believe we had about 450 live viewers for this. Dr. Dino and James W. Is evolution a reasonable scientific theory? So my point is uh, the first quarter is almost done. And I think by the time uh, the first quarter is done, we will have had about 20 to 25 debates in this series. Because before March is done, we still have uh, this week on the 25th, Kent Hoven and Ken Rock, they will be debating evolution. Then on the 31st, we're going to have D. Brian Emery and Dr. Kent Hoven debating, is evolution a scientific theory? And the fun continues into the second quarter of 2022. We're going to have Snake Was Right taking the challenge. Of course, we've got Professor McQueen and Jason Torn. They're going to be debating the Genesis Flood. I'm particularly excited for this one. This is going to be a great, uh, sophisticated debate. Um, so the point is, a new quarter begins. January, February, and March have flown by. We've had a ton of fun. And so anybody who wants to take the Evolution Debate Challenge for April, May, and June, let me know. Shoot me an email and we will uh, set those up. We've already got a couple rematches being set. For example, on uh, April 21st, we've got Wade the Wizard and Kent Hoven round two. So that is uh, much anticipated because the first round was, was a ton of fun. And um, yeah, we're going to be having a, a rematch for that one. Also, as you guys know, last week we had the Big debate on justification. Dr. Robertson, Jenis, and Kelly Powers, that's been getting some great feedback. And I'm happy to say or announce that we are working on another uh, big soteriology-related debate. Um, I'm still working on some of the details. And I'm very excited about the possible interlocutor that we do have for Dr. Robertson, Jenis. Um, I don't want to set anything in stone just yet. Because as I've pointed out, we're working on some of the final details. Uh, but when we do uh, finalize those details and get a date and a time and a format and all that fun stuff, I'll set the event and uh, you guys are going to be pumped. Probably as pumped as I am because, um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. L lots to look forward to, put it that way. And let's see here. I want to make sure I get everything out. Um, on Patreon, uh, I've got one more chapter left and then our appendix of the uh, Independent Origins Handbook, the audio book we got going on. So uh, that's Patreon exclusive. And another thing I'm going to start doing is uh, because I know a lot of people, they're busy, you know, they're on the road maybe for work. So it's, it's much easier and accessible for people to uh, listen rather than than be reading. So what I'm going to be doing uh, in terms of our, our many articles we've published, I'm going to start doing uh, an audio of the, like an audio podcast of these articles. For example, I just put out a highly detailed uh, refutation in the form of an article uh, on endogenous retroviruses. And that article is very thorough. It touches all the bases, leaves no stone unturned. And I notice a lot of the critics are still repeating the same already debunked uh, talking points. So what I'm going to start doing is um, uh, audio articles, I guess you can call it. So we've got a lot of uh, ideas and projects in the works. Michael Who says that should be juicy. Yes, a lot of, uh, a lot of juicy shows coming up. Uh, David said SFT rocks. I appreciate it. Um, I've actually got... Dr. Nathaniel Jensen's new book that should be here soon, hopefully, uh, Traced. Um, I put out a com community post a few days ago regarding it and how it is 
um, confirmation of testable predictions made several years ago, just showing again that it is the young earth creation model that is making the best testable predictions. And as a result, meeting the gold standard of science. So we are going to be doing a review of that book. Um, I believe this Saturday, one of our uh, faithful, hardworking team members, uh, Brandon, he's put together a bit of a presentation in terms of the contents of that book uh, as he's gone through it. He's gone through the entire uh, book in, in ebook form. So we're going to get together, me, him, and Matt, and we're going to do a, a bit of a review of it. And then uh, as Matt and myself work through the physical copy, we'll, we'll do... Um, follow-up shows on it as well. So lots to look forward to. And uh, I'm glad to see that uh, after two and a half hours, we still have a great audience, guys. I know that we touched on a lot here. Uh, the heat problem, refuting some common objections to the flood, another response to the arguments being put forth uh, from Team Gutsit Gibbon on uh, the fossil fuel industry. So please share this around. Again, as I always like to say, the truth is important and critical thinking is important as well. Before I shut it down, um, as you probably know, today we were supposed to have the debate. Uh, this one I am pumped for. So guys, I understand it's been rescheduled a couple times, but trust me, it is going to be well worth the wait. This debate is going to be huge. Chris Date versus Dr. Shabir Ali. This is going to be just as good as the debate between uh, Matt Slick and Dr. Shabir Ali. So these are top uh, scholars and uh, top debaters in their respective fields. So this one will be one to remember. And it's rescheduled for the 30th, which means we are going to have two main events back to back. This will be on the 30th. And then the very next day is going to be uh, the debate between uh, Brian Emery and Ken Hovind. So back to back, two main events. That's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, I believe tomorrow's debate, it looks like we're going to have to reschedule this as one of the debaters uh, is, is, is still sick. And therefore, uh, he may or may not want to uh, do the debate uh, not feeling so well. So if that's the case, though, I have uh, several presentations that I've been working on. And so tomorrow, kind of like I did with the Neanderthal presentation, I will probably uh, go live and give uh, my presentation on the Y chromosome dissimilarity between uh, humans and chimpanzees. So regardless, uh, if we have to reschedule that tomorrow, we are uh, still going to have a show for everybody. And uh, Coco Puffer, good to see you, brother. I've seen your uh, your comments in the uh, comment section, and, and I always appreciate it. You're a genius on the radioisotope uh, dating topic. Uh, Michael, who agreed, brother, we, we'd love to have him on as well. Uh, maybe we will um, we will reach out. So uh, Ashley Myers, I appreciate your support. And uh, she says, you are absolutely correct. I've been listening to your audiobook chapters on the way to work. It's perfect for me. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I'm the same way. I, I like to listen to uh, several lectures a day, especially uh, for the production of this new human evolution book. So I know these days uh, with the hectic uh, lives that people live, uh, audiobooks come in handy. So uh, stay tuned. This audiobook's almost done. Then I'm going to go into probably uh, an audiobook on special creation. Uh, but also on the side, I'm going to get some audio videos for our articles. Uh, most of those will be Patreon specific. So again, uh, we do have a goal for 2022. We want to uh, continue putting out full-time content and bring to reality the uh, many projects that we have going on, including uh, conferences and uh, events such as that, important events, of course. So for as little as a dollar a month, you, you can become a, a patron. And uh, every week we're putting out exclusive uh, Patreon material. So I appreciate that, Ashley Myers. And guys, I think that's it. I think that's it. This has been a great show, ton of fun. Three hours really does fly by. And uh, tomorrow we will have something. If it's not the debate, then uh, I will go live for uh, one of my uh, many presentations that uh, I've got ready to go. Uh, Michael Knighton was epic. I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate your comments and feedback. And I think that's it. That's all that, that kind of comes to mind. So everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Again, this was a ton of fun. Uh, George and David, they're doing some fantastic research. 
And uh, I really enjoyed kind of seeing where where they've uh, gone with it. And uh, this is going to be a an ongoing series, guys, as uh, the research is ongoing. So again, we appreciate your support. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for the comments, engagement, and questions. Standing for Truth is out. God bless.